All right, welcome back. We are on the last part of chapter 19 and this unit, and it talks about community ecology. So with this one, my big take home message is, we all just have to get along. Populations, like I said right here, rarely live in isolation. So you're often having to deal with other species. You're gonna be sharing space, sharing habitats. If you grew up with brothers and sisters, you understand that. So eventually you just have to learn to adapt and survive in the same area. Now remember different populations come together to form the community. And the diversity that you're going to see depends on the habitat that you have. So certain areas are going to have a lot more diversity than other areas. Um, example I put right here is Antarctica. You won't see much there because not a lot of species are adapted to survive there. Versus in rainforest, you're going to see so much. This is an example I think of we got... I think this is a saltwater environment right here, but you can see all the different things and how they're all kind of connected to each other. And it kind of shows like a, where they live on the different trophic levels and how they are food sources for uh, the next level up. Now, one thing that they do talk about this section right here is predation and herbivory. And the predator-prey relationship, if you kind of look at the graph, they kind of look very similar because they do depend on it. If the predator doesn't have the food source, then the number of predators will go down. If the, um, the food source suddenly goes up, there's a lot more food to eat, then the prey will, the population will increase. Um, as I mentioned, you know, predation is you're going to have to kill and consume another member of another population. Like I said, I hate watching that part on the shows. It's just sad to watch. You don't want to watch the little gazelle get killed by the lions, but it does. It's all part of the circle of life. Now your herbivores are going to be your main consumers of plants and they're going to be a bigger con um, contribution when it comes to overall food web when it comes to energy and that's more on the next unit's kind of work. Now to links to this predator prey relationship different animals are, and plants and stuff have different defense mechanisms to kind of help them survive there can be mechanical one think of armor that some insects and stuff have the warns on plants the hard shell on turtles you know that's kind of hard to hard to get through now the goal of this is to cause physical pain to the predator and prevent it from being eaten um, some of them utilize poisons or a chemical defense. A lot of plants will do this, and some animals, they'll be horrible tasting to them and actually might actually kill the prey, sorry, kill the predator for trying to eat them. Now, when that happens, some of them are actually going to use physical things or use their body shape or coloration to help avoid, avoid that. Um, chameleons are a great example. They love to change and camouflage and blend into their environment. They're quite fun to watch. Um, mimicry shows up right here. So this is where if you know that um, certain colors are known to indicate being dangerous, then that species will use those colors to their advantage. Um, example, um, when you see um, um, black and yellow you think of wasp and bees and you know those are painful so uh, another insect will probably use that same coloring and they probably won't be an insect that causes pain but you know anything that sees that color combination knows to stay away from it um, also behavior things you know if you stay away from the predator then you won't get eaten but one thing is we have to all get along. So this comp competitive exclusion principle, sorry, my mouth's not working, is saying um, two species cannot it, occupy the same niche in a habitat. And this is going to be the population lab um, that you will go through. And basically this is an example right here where we have two species growing together, it's the paramecium. And when they grow, and when they're on their own in this habitat, you know, the population will increase, eventually decrease over time. But you know, they can both survive when they're on their own. Now, when you put them together, what you start to see is one species is gonna outwit and outlast the other one. So this one, we had the P. aurella, out-survive and out-compete the P. caudinum species. So this is what your population lab will go over this. It was a lab that you had to click through images, but I have all the images put on slides for you. Now some can live together. That's the process of symbiosis. So 
They might have a common utilism relationship where one benefits and neither one is helped or harmed. Um, birds nesting in trees, you know, the tree doesn't lose anything from a bird nesting there and the bird has a place to great, um, raise their young. Um, you can have it to where both of them, a mutualistic relationship where both of them benefit. Um, termites and protists, so they have protists that thrive in their stomach, which help break down the wood that the termites consumed. Um, the protists aren't harming them. They're just having a place to live and actually providing, breaking down the wood so the termites can use it for a source. And then we have parasites where one benefits and the other is harmed. So, you know, your parasite's going to keep the host around long enough to complete a reproductive cycle. You know, he's going to benefit, he gets to reproduce while causing harm to the host. Now, some of these things will show up later, especially in the next unit. But one thing we do love to talk about is biodiversity. So biodiversity, you know, we're talking about community characteristics. Biodiversity is just talking the different number of species in an area and the abundance. And it all comes down to the habitat and what it can support. So this is just showing a biodiversity map. One of the most diverse areas that you'll see with biodiversity is the area of the rainforest is close to the equator. It, it just so much um, resources available that you can find there and there's so many species that we haven't even identified that live in there and then as I mentioned the increase in biodiversity you'll have an increase in species riches so that's the number of species that happen to live in the area so this map is just showing you the darker green means the higher number of species richness which relates directly to biodiversity now, one thing people do love to study is islands because, you know, they're kind of separated from there. You don't have to worry about populations really moving in and out. And you'll always see a great species richness, richness on isolated islands because there's nothing really taking or, or harming the population. And they kind of been in this um, status quo for such a long time. Now, one thing that we do love to study to get a better understanding of the community are what we call our foundation species and keystone species. So a foundation species, these are going to be at the base of the community, and they're going to have the greatest influence and structure. Um, you'll prob probably see these as primary producers and very abundant. Um, one example is the kelp and brown algae off the coast of California. One that I can think of will be like the coral in co and the coral reefs, and especially in the shallows. Um, they're like the foundation, and when that starts to die off, and then you'll start to see other species leave because you know they are the foundation. They are there, and if, you know if you don't have a good foundation on a home, you start to see cracks happen. The walls will fall down, and all the other stuff too. Now, another is called, what is called a keystone species, where their presence is also necessary to maintain biodiversity. Um, wolves are a good one. Um, you can, you'll have to watch them, and when you start to see the keystone species disappear, that's going to kind of be a big indicator that, okay, something's happening with the population um, on one, one different area that's affecting them. So it's one of those kind of indicators that we kind of keep track of. As I mentioned, there's different types of species. Um, one that we really keep track of is amphibians because they are so reliant on water and they are good species to keep track of, um, especially to notice environments are changing. And then finally, this chapter wraps up with a little bit more about community dynamics, but there's going to always be changes in the community and the composition over time because the environment is constantly changing. Um, natural disasters happen, volcanoes, storms, fire, climate. I always think of Australia right now because they've gone through that horrible series of fires, and I think they're having some again. Um, climate change is really changing things. The oceans are changing. You don't realize it because we don't see it. but there was a great documentary on Netflix where this group actually um, tried to come up with this way to measure um, coral bleaching over time and wanted to have these fixed cameras. And what they did was look over time to see how it was changing. And they had the, what it wasn't working, so they had to physically go and take pictures every day. It's a great thing. It was kind of sad. Now, your goal is to reach community equilibrium where there's a common number of species. But when that doesn't happen, that's when you need to really think about what's going wrong. Now, when you have that severe disruption, you're going to have to do some changes. So first off is you're going to have your primary species come in. So this is like a new environment. 
these are going to be um, species that can thrive in harsh areas. So you're going to have some new exposed rock. I always think of like um, islands that are made from volcanoes. Um, that's going to be very harsh. And you're going to have certain species that can really get in and really get into those rocks. So these are going to be your pioneer species. They're going to break it up further so other species become established. Now, once those have really started to get going, you'll start to see some intermediate and your secondary ones. So this is going to start to distribute your ecosystem, and you're going to start to see it kind of spread. And eventually, you'll get to where you get a climax, where you get like a lot of diversity in there. So that wraps up this chapter. Um, there's some review videos and credit for the slides.